Hi, I'm Stanley Goldberg, host of the Inquiring Mind podcast. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. And if you're new here, I release two episodes a week with a variety of fascinating guests. And I would appreciate if you would support my podcast by liking this video and subscribing down below. Thank you for your support. And now to today's guest. Daryl Bricker, welcome to the Inquiring Mind podcast. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, it's a real pleasure. Um, I listened. I, I rarely listen to audiobooks, but I, I listened to your book, Empty Planet, on uh, Audible. That's, that's not an ad for Audible whatsoever. Uh, I wouldn't say no, but uh, it, was, it was a good, it was a very interesting book uh, full of great ideas. But before we jump in and talk about your books, Empty Planet, and uh, I think your most recent is called Next. Right. Um, can you tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Well, I'm a public opinion researcher by trade. I work for the, the world's largest uh, public opinion research company, which is Ipsos Public Affairs, where I'm the, the CEO of the public affairs division, and we're part of Ipsos, uh, which is the world's uh, third largest market research company headquartered in Paris. Uh, my background uh, um, was initially political science, uh, um, and uh, I got into uh, public opinion polling uh, and political polling, I guess is a first career, and um, have continued on with that as, uh, at, at Ipsos. But uh, one of the things that I really developed an interest in is writing, and particularly writing about things like demographic change. So um, uh, Empty Planet is really just a, a manifestation of my day work where I'm interested in what the people are saying, but also uh, really understanding that something that's really important for our future is what the, the basic nature of people is going to be, not just in terms of what they're thinking, but their composition. So I think the two things kind of go hand in hand. So um, I think my uh, curiosity about public opinion led, led to my curiosity about demography. And uh, my professional life is really more related to public opinion, but my, my literary life is really more related to topics like uh, like um, Empty Planet, and, and really just trying to get some sense on what's projectable about the future and what we can know based on data. And everything I do is about data, but I try not to do it with showing any charts or graphs or confusing people with numbers, but it's data-driven. Uh, but um, it really is about things that I think we can forecast with a regional, reasonable level of reliability. So, you know, knocking through myths and trying to get some real facts on the table so people can understand what the future is going to look like. What is your... Uh job at Ipsos consists of what do you guys do on a day-to-day -day basis and what do you do as the man in charge? Uh, well, public affairs. So I run global public affairs, which is uh, about a thousand people in 38 countries, 40 countries sometimes. And, and uh, so I have responsibility for overseeing all of the activity that takes place um, in those places that relates to doing research, mostly for governments and for NGOs on um, everything from evaluating the performance of programs through to looking at whether or not people are prepared to get uh, COVID vaccines through to uh, you know, uh, running the largest uh, poll, a regular poll on public global public opinion called Global Advisor, where we interview people every month in 29 countries on any type of subject you might be interested in looking at. And can you uh, elaborate on what is the process of polling somebody uh, or a group of people for information on any given subject? Well, it depends. I mean, uh, in the old days, it used to be, you know, one method, you go and knock on somebody's door, or you would intercept them someplace and you interview them face to face. And then the next big innovation is we started using telephone to do it. Uh, today, we have more ways of contacting people than we ever have in the past. We can contact you online. I mean, there's passive data measurement, there's you know, uh, you know, it's traditional face-to-face -face surveys. We still do them in a lot of markets, telephone surveys, online panel surveys. There's a whole variety of things that we can use to try and understand what people are thinking about various subjects at any moment in time. And uh, so it's, uh, in some ways, it's become uh, a, a lot more complicated because you use all of these multiple methods, but you're really trying to achieve that simple task, which is to try and understand what the, the public's thinking in reality. Do you feel like in recent years, uh, for example, in the United States, maybe in Canada, I'm not, I'm not so sure, there has been a loss of trust when it comes to polling data, uh, data compared to maybe a decade or you know, two decades ago? 
Yeah, well, maybe there was too much trust placed in public opinion mm -hmm. research in the past, because it's not like, you know, misses in terms of election campaigns or unknown things. I mean, you know, there's very, very many famous photographs of people tearing up newspapers based, you know, headlines based on, on, uh, on predictions from polls. But uh, I think what's happened of late is that um, what we're trying to do in the polling industry and in election polling in particular is harder to do than it used to than it used to be. Um, it's not that the, the failures are, are you know, uh, I would say any more any more numerous than they were in the past. Uh, it might seem like they are. It's just that there seems to be a a really high level of awareness of 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 polls and you know uh, a really um, uh, I would say a high level of scrutiny beyond what we, we used to get where people used to just treat them as facts. They were probably wrong to do that at the time. And in some ways we've kind of over rotated in the other direction. Yes, there have been issues with polls, but um, you know, generally speaking, they're still the pretty much the best way to predict what's going to happen in something, for example, like an election campaign. And I'll give you the U S campaign as a, as a good example. I mean um, so, you know, what did the polls predict? Well, the polls predicted that Joe Biden was going to win. Well, he did win. Uh, did they predict that uh, Donald Trump was going to do as well as he did? No, they weren't quite accurate. But we're not talking off by 10 points or 20 points. We're talking, you know, by three or four, maybe in, in, in some polls. Some polls were a little more extreme, but the, the average of polls was actually not that far off. In terms of the number of states that uh, each of the, uh, the contenders was going to win, the polls were generally accurate about the um, which states would go which way? There was a couple where there's a, um, you know, a, a little bit of a, a little bit of difficulty, but uh, it's not like everyone was wrong. By far, most of them were pretty much right. Did they get the absolute number correct? Well, that's a harder test. But the winner and loser, they did generally get right in most of the in most of the states. Uh, when you go further down ballot, when you start looking at races in which there's lower turnout levels, and so or lower participation levels in some instances, and you know, uh, uh, you know. Uh, it's, it's, it's harder to sort of drill down into these very specific places. Did they not perform as well as they have in the past? Yeah, I'd say that that's a, a fairly reasonable charge. But, you know, overall, was there anything that did a better job of predicting any of that stuff? And, and I, I, if there was, I, I didn't see it. I'm, I, I stand ready to look at what the challenge, you know, that the, the, uh, the alternative methodology might be. But, um, you know, they did not a horrible job. Could it do better? Absolutely. Better than what, what else is available? Definitely. Now, I haven't seen anything that I think effectively contends with doing that type of uh, 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 predicting election outcomes. So uh, that doesn't mean that it's perfect. Uh, it certainly isn't. It's getting harder every day. Um, you know, we're trying different methods, looking at sampling in different ways. We're doing all sorts of different things to try and improve all the time. But uh, is it broken? No. Uh, could it be better? Yes. Uh, and has it performed reasonably, reasonably well if you look over the span of time? And the answer to that question is also yes. What I find interesting or most interesting about polling is that after 2016 in the United States, I heard so many people on one side of the aisle uh, go, we're going to throw out polling altogether. It's pointless. Look, they couldn't even predict that this, this guy was going to win and we can't believe it. But what I found most interesting is that maybe a couple of months in, people always pick up the po polls that kind of confirm their biases or confirm what policies they want to pass. So they still they don't throw out the baby, uh, they don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. They keep they keep the polling that they find uh, politically expedient, and then maybe they overlook some of the data that comes out that's contrary to their beliefs. Um, it, that's what I found politically, personally. Yeah, like uh, as they say, you know, a drunk you know, using a using a light stand <laughs> to hold <laughs> themselves up. I mean, yeah, yeah, to a certain to a certain degree, that's true. But you know, I I don't. I've been doing this for so long that I've heard just everything that you could possibly say about this topic. I certainly form my own opinions about it, and most of my personal view of of what what's going on in this industry is that pollsters have to be a lot more humble. Um, and uh, uh, users of polling have to be a lot more uh, discriminating. And um, I think that the responsible pollsters are as appalled as anybody, uh, when th more appalled than most, I would say, uh, 
uh, when they don't do a good job. And it's, you know, interesting, the media just moves on to the next thing or, you know, political observers just move on to the next thing. I think that the truly responsible pollsters go back and they take a look and they try to figure it out. And they try to improve it the next time that uh, that they go out. And just because people, you know, may move back to their previous behavior doesn't give you the excuse not to change. So my view is that uh, um, I, I think that pollsters have a responsibility, given that they're out in the public domain and their influence. You know, polls do influence campaigns. I don't think that there's any doubt about that. So you have a responsibility to do the best possible job that you can do. And you know, you should be shamefaced when you get it wrong. But shame isn't enough. You have to improve. What do you, uh, what do you have to say for maybe people that, um, again, I, I heard about this in the United States more with like exit polling, for example, um, people saying that they voted for one person when in reality they voted for another because they thought uh, that if they said something to the contrary, those ideas would be used against them. How do you account for those kind of um, situations when it comes to polling? Yeah, we, we see it so much uh, that there's actually a term for it. It's called social desirability bias. Oh. So these are people who don't want to have confrontations or they're, or they're going to tell you what they think you want to hear in order to avoid a confrontation. Uh, and, you know, the U.S. presidential election, I guess, maybe is a, a recent example of that, but it's not the only one. I mean, you know, in the Scottish referendum, clearly a problem. I mean, somebody knocks on your door and says, do you want to vote you know, for independence for Scotland? And and, you know, it's kind of hard to be the one person who says, oh, no, I'll, no, actually, I don't want to. I want to stay in the UK. You're not going to go to the bar, for example, you know, a pro-Scottish bar and be the one person who's going to put up your hand and say, no, I'm going to still vote for the other side. So there's a there's a there, there is, a, you know, a, a, some aspect of external sanction and fear of external sanction that can influence what people respond. I mean, in my own country, and I'm speaking to you from Canada today. Um, and I, I live in Canada. I mean, we have the same phenomena when it comes to uh, uh, separatism in the province of Quebec, you know, separatists, people who are federalists and aren't, aren't supportive of the separatist cause in the past have been reluctant to uh, um, uh, express their point of view. So we, you know, we call them shy sovereignists or shy federalists, actually, in that instance. So, you know, there's, there are many examples. It's not just the U.S. presidential election. And for polling, how does it work? Does, does uh, say if it's a candidate for a political party, I'm going to stick with the political party. I think it's the easiest sure. way to kind of, uh, do they procure your services or do you collect the data and then provide it to the, maybe to a bidder? Or, I don't know how it works. So can you, how does it it's work? More, it's more of the first. Although Ipsos, I mean, there's a couple of countries and there's different different approaches to this in different countries. Um, but mostly we work for the media. So we usually have a media partner or we're doing it on our own because we're interested in, in um, demonstrating our skill um, and promoting our brand in, in the marketplace. Um, but uh, usually for us, it's the media. There are other countries, say, for example, France, where you know, Ipsos is headquartered in France, um, where uh, pollsters are seen almost like uh, ecumenical uh, data specialists. So they'll work for all the one pollster will work for all the parties and they'll also work for the media and they don't have any trouble with that. Whereas in the United States and countries like Canada, and I think increasingly in other countries, that's not the profile of the pollster. The pollster is seen as a campaign consultant is loyal to the particular candidate that they're working for. And they will not be seen as an objective um, a source of public opinion information. They would be seen as somebody who's working on behalf of a, a particular uh, a particular candidate or a particular party, but in all of those instances, these would be people who would be buying. You know, you'd be on contract to provide them with research, and and uh, they, you would be selling them that. There are instances in what we call syndicated studies, in which we will do the study ourselves, and then we'll go out and we'll, we'll look for subscribers. But that's the by far the the biggest uh, group are people who are um, contracting directly with us. And in terms of framing questions to, for polls. Is that mainly the person that's, again, procuring the service, or is it the you guys that are deciding how to frame the questions? Well, it's usually us. I mean, it's, there are some instances, so, you know, there are clients that are, can be very highly skilled in developing survey questions, and, and uh, you know, they're just looking for somebody to work with to collect the data and uh, so, you know, there are instances of that, but when it comes to this type of polling, the public the polling that's released into the public environment, uh, that, uh, that we do for political campaigns, we're, we're the authors of the questions. Okay. Um, 
So maybe to shift topics a little bit, can can you tell me, obviously I started off this podcast by mentioning you have to, uh, the two latest books, if I'm not mistaken, is Empty Planet and Next. Uh, mm -hmm. I didn't get to read Next, uh, but I did get to read Empty Planet. How did you first come across the issue that you write about an empty planet and why did you decide to put pen to paper and uh, write write the book well um first of all next is just exclusively about canada so your, your audience probably isn't going to be that interested in it so it's okay not to talk about next <laughs> um if you're doing a canadian podcast it might be different but empty planet which i wrote with uh, uh, uh the writer at large at the globe and mail which is uh, basically like the wall street journal and the new york times and the Washington Post and, you know, all rolled into one. Uh, their writer at large is, is named John Ibbotson. And we've written a book together before called The Big Shift, which was about Canada. Uh, but uh, Empty Planet, um, I co-authored with John. And um, we both have been interested in this topic for a period of time. Uh, John, uh, when we've talked about it, started thinking about it back in the early 2000s. I know I've been writing and presenting on it since the early 1990s, some elements of it. And, and um, I think what sparked the interest in doing the book was just you know, the heightened rhetoric about you know, overpopulation. We were, we're hearing a lot of this. And, and I think that anybody who knows anything about this topic and has studied this topic knows that that's a fairly um, uh, uh, thin claim to make. It's a, it's a difficult argument to make these days based on what's actually happening with the population. So John and I are uh, always interested when we write, I mean, we've written two books, like I said, uh, and we're always interested in what we call vertical knowledge, that thing that people believe that's just not true. <laughs> and this was one of those things. It was, it was, it was perfect for that. And um, so you know, conversations with each other, uh, things that we were encountering, you know, from analysts and, and in other places, we just decided that this was one of those great vertical knowledge, counterintuitive, counterfactual uh, kinds of uh, topics to really dig into. Yeah, what's interesting about your book is that for a long time, people considered uh, overpopulation to be the real concern. You flip the script, as you just mentioned, and you write about how population decline is actually in some ways more dangerous and more uh and there's some serious repercussions to that happening in in the in, in developed countries such as you know canada uh the united states and most european countries uh why is population decline such a such a pressing issue in your opinion well, actually, what we say in the book, Stanley, is that it's uh, we try not to take sides on this one. <laughs> um, so, uh, and we don't take sides on it. Actually, neither one of us. Um, and so, what we say in the book, and there's actually a sentence in the book that says this: it's not a good thing, it's not a bad thing, but it's a big thing. And and so our our job was to really just awa raise awareness of the facts, yeah. what what is actually happening in terms of global population. Now, it's interesting that you focused on. Um, uh, developed countries. Uh, one of the things that we wanted to say in the book was that, um, in fact, the people who think that this is just developed countries, this is again vertical knowledge. It's not true. It's actually happening in developed countries. China, as well. India, yeah. Yeah, China is going to lose half of its population through the course of the century, and it it may have already started. And and you sit, you, you say that to people, and they look at you like, what? Are you nuts? I mean. How did you come to that conclusion? And it's like, well, let me walk you through the data and you can see, I mean, you can't come to any other conclusion. And, and so, yes, uh, flip the script, um, you know, anything that you can use to describe to go in the opposite direction is what we were trying to do in the book. And, and what we say is that it's not a good thing, it's not a bad thing, but it's a big thing. And there are some things that it's good for and there's some things that it's, it could potentially be bad for. So let's talk about that. But the main point of the book is, we do get into uh, some of those things, but the main point of the book is just to take that one point, that big balloon, and stick a stick a pin in it and say this is just not correct. You need to prepare for a different future. Yeah, I think I think the reason people say are are you know maybe taken aback by the statement that 
China is going to lose half of its population by because what's the population of China? Like one at 1.2 billion or a, a billion? 1.4. 1.4. 1. 4. 1. 4. You're talking about what, 700 million people. You're yeah. saying you're going to lose 700 million people. That's a staggering amount. Uh, Japan, lo- Japan loses 400,000 people every year from its population. But what's Japanese, uh, Japan's population? About 130, I think it's 138 million the last time I looked. And so what are, it's not immaterial. It's they're going to lose. Uh, actually, I wrote in a. I think I wrote in Empty Planet that they are going to lose more people over the next ten years than they lost civilian and military casualties in the Second World War. So, uh, which was a demographic catastrophe for Japan. And and so that's what we do in Empty Planet. We don't put up a bunch of charts and graphs. I mean, the book is footnoted to death, so you can go find all of the information that we use. But we really had a strong view that it had to be a good audio book. It had to be a good story. It had to be a good um, read. There's no charts or graphs. There's, I think right. there's one chart because the editor uh, insisted on it, but we really tried to present this as just a story. It's fact-based, but it's, 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 it's a narrative. What was your reaction when you came across this data? It was like on peeling an onion. That's actually a really good question. <laughs> uh, um, it was like on peeling an onion. I mean, I kind of start in one place or, or following up maybe even following a, a, you know, a string. It was just, the, the more I pulled it, the more string there was. I mean, and, and it was the same with John. So the more things that we pulled together, the more it became obvious. And then um, uh, what we did was we decided that uh, it wasn't enough to just write, you know, sit in, John's in Ottawa and I'm here in Toronto, sit in our offices and write this book. We decided to go out and report it. So we went out and traveled the world. So I would, I had a hypothesis in my head about what I thought I was going to find, and I was never right. Um, and a lot of the, uh, I knew statistically what I was right, but I, I just, I, I couldn't quite accept it. I mean, going to a slum in Delhi and experiencing what I experienced was not anything I ever thought was going to happen. You know, a woman taking a smartphone out from under her sari because I, I saw it glowing underneath and looking at it and sticking it back in. And she's sitting in this abject poverty, but she's got a smartphone. And I'm thinking, how can you not, how can she not know about birth, birth control? How can she not know about, and, and the fact of the matter is she does. And she spent two hours telling me about it in the discussions that we had. So what happened was I, I, I would go in with one impression and, and experience or encounter what, uh, what was happening on the ground and come back with all sorts of real people material, like real experiences showing how this was happening in a very personal way. And that, that, that really is the strength of the book. I think it's, it's, we take the statistical premise, but we make it real. We, yeah. by talking to people and John did it and I did it. Uh, we went a different place. We never, we never went anywhere together. We went separately to the various places that we went to. And in some ways, the book is almost like a travelogue. I mean, going from, you know, Nairobi through to Delhi, through to Sao Paulo, through to Seoul, through to all the places that we visited. And, and uh, you know, all of these places, as, as I, I, I think I, I said one time to someone, it's really a book about culture. I mean, that's what it is. All of these places ended up in the same, same direction or the same things are happening, but they all have kind of their own different way of getting there. So that's the, I think that's the, the, the thing that I'm um, proudest of, of in the book is we took a, this really, what could have been a very dense statistical argument and usually is a dense statistical argument, made the point, supported it all through factual material in, in the footnotes, but made it a story that anybody could sit down and read and get and see what was happening in the lives of other people in their own lives. Right. And you just mentioned the fact that uh, this is a, Book more about culture than maybe about um, they they they're all dealing with the same trend, but it's a the difference in cultural issues, uh, cultural. Um, I'm trying to find the word for oh just differences in culture. I'm sorry, but yeah. um, what what were the most staggering differences in culture that you saw, you know, during your travels? Well, I just mentioned the one about uh, smartphones and <laughs> in slums in Delhi. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, when I went to Africa and I started talking to young people about uh, their lives and, and how they looked at, you know, forming partnerships and I went, go into a long description. That That's me in Nairobi going through all of this and not understanding how traditional cultures and traditional 
ways of life um, actually work against, work in, 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 in concert with uh, modern um, occurrences to create a, a strange type of outcome that leads to, uh, uh, leads to declining fertility and declining population. And I'll, I'll just fill that in for you. So um, people moved from the country to the city, uh, particularly women, their lives change, but they're still very plugged into their family networks. So there's a, there's a big conversation in the book about bride prices and how men and women get together, uh, form couples in, 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 uh, in Kenya and how the need to be able to demonstrate on a, a, a young man's behalf that he's capable of, it, of taking care of his family, combined with the need for a, a bride uh, to be able to demonstrate that she's going to be able to make a contribution to a family, it keeps them both in school for a, a longer than anybody would have in previous generations ever stayed in school in, 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 in Kenya. And uh, it means that they get married later and they tend to have smaller families, even though they tend to find their, 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 uh, their connections in the same way that they used to, which was, you know, the aunties, you know, going out and finding somebody who would be a suitable person. It's, they're not quite arranged marriages, but they're sort of like arranged marriages. But then there's this added new modern capitalist aspect to it, which is you have to show that you're a good earner and that takes time, which means you need a good education and you need a good job. So this very traditional thing that would normally put a woman in a situation where she was married very young and then she'd have lots of kids is now actually delaying uh, couples getting together and, um, and, uh, and uh, starting their families. And the other part of that, I mentioned the bride price before. I mean, you just don't get married like we get married in North America. Dowries are important. I mean, they call them bride prices, dowries or whatever. So the young man, in order to be able to marry the young woman has to be able to raise a certain amount of money to contribute to the family, which means that he's got to stay in school for longer. He's got to get a better job. He's got to be able to have a, you know, a house or an apartment or be established, which means that he's, instead of 20, he's now 30. And so, and all of this leads to the same thing, but none of those factors are issues in Brazil or Belgium or in China. <laughs> They're not issues there, but they have similar types of things that keep people uh, um, from getting married as soon as they used to, combined with um, starting their families later and smaller. Brazil is a bit of an exception because people still tend to have their first their first child fairly young. Uh, but uh, uh, you know, Brazil's uh, uh, as we talk about in the book, their um, the, the the preferred form of contraception is a sterilization. By the way, in most in many developing countries, it is. And that uh, the thing about Brazil, because of certain features of the healthcare system, women tend to, they, they, they do what they call shut down the factory. So they'll have two kids and they'll get sterilized and, and they'll do it at a very young age, like they'll 24 or 25. But, and then it leads to the same kind of thing that you see in, in, in Kenya, but for completely different reasons, small families again, right? And, and all of this, all of this pushes against higher fertility. Yeah. But at the same time, I think, um, these are trends that people maybe in the, in the United States and Canada uh, are encouraged by, right? Like they, they want women to have independence, to get a good education, to get, uh, mm -hmm. to have upward mobility in their societies, get good jobs, you know, um, and, and the same opportunities that men traditionally had for, for centuries, they want women to have around the world. Yet it has this kind of like maybe adverse effect. Um, one thing that, I'm not sure if you wrote this exactly in the book, but maybe I read between the lines or maybe I made an assumption, but um, it seems to me that overpopulation could be somewhat undone, right? Like you can, you can limit birth rates or whatever somehow. I mean, it's difficult, but it's, it's, it's more possible. When you, when you start having a decline in population, that's a, uh, very hard to undo and hard to make people have kids uh, or have more kids. Am I correct in that analysis? Well, there may be a solution, but nobody's found it. Uh, and, and so just for your listeners, I mean, the, the birth rate uh, to just have a replacing population is 2.1. So each woman in a country having 2.1 children uh, in, in her lifetime. 
And uh, anything below that is a population that will inevitably shrink unless there's a strong levels of immigration. Uh, and uh, there are you know, no countries in the world, not one, actually Israel is one exception, uh, that have been able to find a way to reverse uh, fertility decline above 2.1, not one. Uh, how has Israel managed to do it? There are so many, and now the obvious ones are, you know, uh, we have to, can't let our population, you know, drop for nationalist reasons. I mean, that's the obvious one that you would say, but I've also seen things that say that's not really a factor. So I'm not really sure what the reason is, uh, but uh, you can take the countries that are usually held up as the ones that are the best examples of having, you know, good life, work-life balance, high levels of happiness, good, uh, good uh, maternity programs, good uh, child care programs, usually funded by the state available. And those are the Nordic countries and all of them are below replacement rate fertility. Hmm. Now there's one country in the world that's trying and, and we might see other countries in the world try to change this around and that's Hungary, which has put in huge financial incentives for women to have more children. Uh, um, and uh, so we'll see whether or not that's going to actually have an effect. Um, but to this point, I mean, it's, it's too early to say, but um, uh, you know, that's, a, that's a great example of a rapidly aging and shrinking population. And the thing is on this, Stanley, you only have a period of time to do it uh, because um, every year the number of, because the biology of reproduction is still the traditional biology of of reproduction and every year the population ages and the older the population gets the less fertile it becomes so not only is it something that if you don't solve it right right away it's not or change it right away it's not going to change around but your ability to to change it gets weaker every day yeah i think that's a little bit of a what you said before um is a little bit of a like a myth busting kind of uh statement when you said uh, that countries with the biggest social safety nets, which traditionally people want in more developed countries that are richer and they want that because they could afford it or, you know, that's where uh, fertility is under the 2.1 number that you, you, mm -hmm. you mentioned before. That's a staggering, that, that has like serious policy repercussions too, I think, because if you if you mention that to a policymaker, because in the past you would think that's an incentive for women to have kids, right? To be able to support them uh, through uh, universal pre-K or or better healthcare, or you know, not going bankrupt when you get go to the hospital, or whatever. That those are all good things, but they don't actually increase a woman's uh, desire maybe to have children. No, not really. I mean, around the margins. I mean, Canada is a great example of this where, you know, in Quebec, they've spent a fortune on, um, on uh, um, uh, low cost childcare. So like $20 a day childcare and their fertility rate is, uh, you know, I think the last time I looked, it was 1.7. I mean, you know, the Canadian average today is about one point. Uh, probably about 1.5. I mean, they're a little bit higher than the national average, but Alberta's birth rate is, is higher and they don't have that. And, and the reason is because that's not the reason that people have children or they don't have children. Uh, the reason people have children today is basically for self-actualization. Most of the children that are born, particularly in developed countries, are wanted kids. And, and um, you know, after one or two, you're pretty self-actualized. So, <laughs> you know, offering people free childcare does not lead to child child three and does not lead to child four. Um, it's, it's just the choices that women are making in their lives. But it, uh, but it does, when, when a person does have kids, when a woman and the family, whatever, have kids, uh, it does alleviate a lot of the concerns that they have financially. Uh, sure. If they have those. Programs. Yeah, but, but so what? <laughs> yeah, exactly. If you're not having any more kids, I mean, it, it's not going to have any impact on the, the, um, uh, on the, the population, whether it's going to go up or down. Uh, the, the, the real question, I think, on childcare is about fairness and the quality of opportunities that are offered to both women uh, when they do have children 
mm -hmm. uh, to make sure that their children are raised in the best possible environment, but also fairness to the children themselves. So I think there's a strong argument that you can make about that. But if your argument is that you're going to change around declining fertility, forget that because nobody's figured it out. It hasn't worked. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you also talk about one of the major, I guess, themes in your book is the importance of immigration in countries such as Canada, United States, and, and so forth. Um, with the decline in birth rates, usually we, these countries supplant the, the, that population with, with a steady uh, growth in the amount of immigrants we take in. Have you, are you concerned that these countries are abandoning those values of immigration? Or, or no? Well, they should be concerned. Whether I'm concerned, they should be concerned because the problem is that the only possible solution you have to this is to either embrace immigration for the short to medium term, because quite frankly, that's going to be removed as a as an option at some point as well. Because young people are the only ones who immigrate, and the, all the countries that are the big sources of immigration, even for the United States, I mean Mexico. <laughs> doesn't send really immigrants to the United States anymore. I think that, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, there are all these myths associated with what's happening. The birth rate in Mexico today is about 2.1, right? It's, it's, they're, they're, they, they're running out of young people to have crossed the border too. So you either um, figure out how you're going to use immigration to mitigate some of the worst parts of this, which are, for example, like uh, lack of access to people with skilled trades and, and, you know, labor force related things, it becomes almost like a recruiting policy, or you get used to a smaller, older population. There's really, there's really no other choice. There's nothing in between. Mm -hmm. But also another concern for women, maybe not wanting to have kids, um, is the fact that they don't believe that the next generation will have a better life or more opportunities than they do. Is, is that correct? Or... <laughs> Yeah, well, I think there's people who are activists to say that, but you know, if you look at what the state of the world is today, compared to what the state of the world was then when those kids themselves who are deciding not to have kids uh, were born or their parents were born, it's on just about everything that you can measure, it's better today. So I, I don't understand the argument. The other argument I don't understand is that, you know, we have to have this one child or two child pledge uh, like you saw, uh, you know, Meghan Markle and Prince Harry get an award from a group in the UK over this. It's like, well, the birth rate of the UK is 1.7. <laughs> like, you, you're agreeing to have two kids. Well, that's actually over the average. I mean, but, you know, we have this, the, the people are still stuck in this 1968 Paul Ehrlich model about, you know, the population bomb is going to be, is going to explode. No, it's not. It's actually going to implode. It's going to go in the other direction. It's going to be a population bust. So if you're doing those things, that's great. That's a choice for you in your life. That's fine. Are you helping the planet? No, not really. Not really. Uh, well, the reason is because nobody else is having kids either. You're not doing anything special. So um, I know, again, I know you said that you guys tried to approach this in a very neutral way, not trying to make... But this seems to me like a uh, a serious issue. I mean, the way you're describing, like oh, it's not going to explode like the the like in 1968, but it's it's going to implode. Uh, how do you prevent this implosion? I, I I honestly don't think that you can. I think you 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 have to get prepared oh. for it. You might be able to slow it down, uh, but I think you know what, what John Evanson and I were arguing in the book is you have to get ready for it. You have to understand why it's happening. And you have to prepare for it. And, and uh, um, the, uh, you know, and it's not going to be like a collapse. You know, all of a sudden it's going to happen. It's going to be a gradual process, accelerated, by the way, by the, the COVID pandemic, uh, because it's COVID has crushed birth rates. So, you know, China uh, 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 six weeks ago, or two months ago, announced its census and its fertility rate is 1.3. Well, the UN better check their estimates because it's based on a fertility rate of 1.8. Mm -hmm. Right. And even the study that has China losing 700 million, 635 million people still has the Chinese birth rate at 1.5. So it, COVID's accelerated all of these things. So all you can do is get ready for it and get ready for an older, heavily urbanized, smaller global population. The good parts of that are all probably related to the environment. So if you're somebody out there who's arguing 
that um, uh, the climate change is driven by the activities of human beings, uh, you should be rejoicing what we're talking about an empty planet because there's going to be fewer human beings to harm the harm the planet. That, that's you know undeniable. But if you're anybody who's selling things to consumers and you're uh, you know you're you believe that uh, the global economy is going to be growing because the population is growing, you know we'll check that noise because it's not going to happen. It's going to go the other way. And how would a government prepare for this kind of implosion? Stage one, I think, is consider reconsidering your immigration policies because um, there's going to be a, a fight going forward for particularly skilled labor um, in, in the marketplace. So having a realistic conversation about what your immigration policies are going to be. By the way, John and I are not naive about this point. We also know that the biggest driver of nativist populism in the world today, one of the most destructive forces that we have in politics, is immigration. So this is a real difficult issue to manage. It's not a simple numbers game to play. You know, when I hear, I, so there was a book in the United States talking about, you know, 1 billion Americans in Canada. We have a group talking about 100 million Canadians. Oh, we're just going to get them through immigration. Really? Have you seen what that's caused in places like Europe and, you know, what's caused, what's happened in politics in the United States? This is a very, very difficult to issue to manage politically. It's not just a numbers game. So, you know, I think, Politicians and governments are going to have to you know, come to terms with how they're going to be able to integrate immigration into this. The second thing is starting to think about the redistribution of, of um, uh, wealth in, in, in the country, particularly generational wealth. We're going to be asking younger people to take on an awful lot of responsibility for older people, and the older people have all the money. So what are we going to do about that? Because that's going to be a challenge going forward. Uh, the rethinking of how we take care of older people in our population. We saw with COVID that this was a disease that infected generally, but killed pretty specifically. And uh, one of the reasons that US population growth is going to be down this year, and it actually may not even be growing this year, uh, is because of unexpected disproportionate deaths among elderly people. Because most population growth in the world right now is actually people not dying as soon as they used to. We talk about that a lot in the book. Yeah. Um, so uh, if you have uh, an unexpected level of death among the older population, that has a huge impact because that's the part of the population that was growing. So the shrinking <clears throat> is going to start even faster. So thinking of, about ways to take care of older people um, and to think about how you're going to operate an economy in which you're not going to be able to grow as a result of consumer consumption unless you can figure out a way to get older people to buy stuff. Uh, because that's the that's the the strength of the future future marketplace is going to be older people, not younger people. But you have to unlock their wealth. So there's a lot of there's a lot of complicated things that are going to go on this on on this. And I haven't even mentioned retirement, which we completely have to reconsider. Can you elaborate? Well, I mean, the idea that you can just you know ride your pony off into the sunset at the age of sixty and have a second career and be expected to get a full pension and and uh, you're going to live to the age of in the United States now on average to around 80 um, is a little difficult to consider given what the shape of the population is going to be, particularly given that you're probably pretty healthy for a longer period of time. And many of those people want to work. What's the incentive that we're going to give them to work because we're going to need them. Mm -hmm. I mean, we talk about diversity in, in, in the workplace and all the focus is on, uh, you know, racial diversity, gender diversity, very, very age. little focus on age diversity in which it's actually all right to discriminate to a lot of people. You know, how many jokes do you see on television about older people or on, you know, uh, sitcoms or whatever, and it's still okay to talk about that kind of thing, which, which causes problems when you start thinking about a more integrated age-based workforce, but you would never consider doing that, you know, to someone who was, say, for example, African-American. But you know, older people, it's still okay. It's still, that's one of the safe places you can still, uh, you know, have a, have a, you know, a, a view that works against their ability to participate in fairly and, and equally in the, uh, in, in employment. Um, but, you know, that's something we're going to have to reconsider because we're going to need right. them. The idea that you retire at 65, um, you know, I'm 60. <laughs> you know, I'm still going. I'm, I haven't done my best work yet. Why would in five years I be asked to walk away? I may have my own choice, but um, you know, if I want to contribute, there should be a way for me to contribute. But that's not that's not the feeling that you get out there. 
right? That's, so that's such an interesting point. I've actually never thought about that. You're right uh, because uh, I don't know if you saw this movie. That that's what I was thinking about while you were talking about it. Um, the intern with uh, Robert yeah. De Niro. Yeah, and uh, you know the premise is an uh, older man gets gets an internship at a at a company where only young people work. That's essentially what the world might look like, uh, based on what you're describing, right? Like, and, and there's why no not? and and there's no reason not to have a world like that. Well, right. Particularly if you're you know, if a person continue can continue to be a taxpayer and participating in the marketplace and and you know leading to uh, you know good productivity in the place that they're, that they're working at. But you know what? Maybe you're going to have to you know. Uh, rethink the idea of an open office concept because that ambient noise, old ears can't hear that well in that, <laughs> in that kind of an environment. So there's all of this stuff that we think about for, you know, you know, making millennials happy in the workplace. Well, there's not as many of them as we think, first of all. And secondly, they're not as young as we think. I mean, the oldest millennials are now in their 40s. Right. Right. Huh. Uh that's 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 so fascinating um, because these are questions that I you never hear addressed and and by anybody really and you know you might read the odd book here and there uh, addressing this kind of issue and I think that kind of brings me to my next point and have you met any policy thinkers any pol uh, any any you know senators or congressmen as uh, you know, members of parliament or whatever that are thinking about these issues and are trying to implement some of the things you just described? Some, um, and, but it's still for a lot of people fairly abstract and, and, and it's a new idea. And, but the truth is it's coming at us so fast. But in you know the political process that's from one election to the next election or one year to the next year or the, from one poll to the next poll doesn't you know is, is, is sort of looking at the here and now and is not necessarily looking at even five years out. I think the coronavirus crisis um, and the pandemic uh, has created a level of attention on long-term care that was long overdue for the oldest elderly. Um, uh, but when it comes to things like the workplace and what the working environment is going to be, like, I mean, why would it be that a senior couldn't do the job that I'm doing on a screen like I'm doing it right now? I mean, I don't have to lift anything. No. Um, you know, the technologies, uh, you know, we can make it, we, we can make it work. Uh, but I think that people still think that this is all about finding young people jobs. And it's like, yeah, yeah, we're going to have to do that, but there's not enough of them. Is it also about uh, maybe over or thinking about long-term workplace culture? I know that's an emphasis again for millennials and for the new generation coming into working in major companies and and, and offices now. But if if now you're planning to have, you know, people that are older, maybe you know, 65, 66 in your office. Do you have to rethink your workplace culture so you can retain employees for a long time because they can't retire as quickly? Yeah, you're going to have to do all of that. Huh. And, 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 and it'll probably be more choice based where people will, uh, um, you know, uh, have and, you know, the idea that you get your gold watch and you leave on a certain date is probably going to come under question where it's more of a gradual approach uh, to how we look at retirement. But there are already countries for example, I think I was reading in Germany the other day, and I apologize if I get this wrong, the country, but, you know, they've already advanced their, uh, um, uh, their uh, retirement age from 65 to 67, because, because they have to, um, you know, they're running out of people. <laughs> it's, they, well, actually, the German population grew slightly and because of immigration, and uh, at least the first generation of immigrants tend to have higher birth rates, but um, there, you know, there are towns in, in in uh, rural Germany that are basically closing down. You can buy, there's stories all the time that you see, you know, rural Italy where towns are, you know, they've, they've, they've become abandoned because the only people who are left there were old um, as everybody moves to, as everybody moves to the city. So, you know, the inability to attract, um, uh, the, the inability to produce our population is creating, reproduce our population is, is creating all of these interesting challenges but right now we kind of treat them as curiosities like the idea in japan you know that they would put 
in you know rural communities they would put you know full-size dummies so people in bus shelters so people don't feel like they're alone uh, when they're sitting oh, in, the, in, the, in the bus oh you can find it they're, you're kidding no they they, they do it um <laughs> maybe it's, to a certain extent it's a novelty but it, it's happening in a lot of places in 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 japan um well because that's the reality of 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 what's going on there's only old people out there and there's fewer of them every day and 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 these are not they're, they're kind of like funny anecdotes and episodes right now but this is this is the trend this is right. where it's going i'm not making this stuff up i'm, I'm not <laughs> I, I i wasn't laughing because it was just funny it was just it's it's staggering to me it's shocking it, it's yeah. shocking um can we I'm, I'm i'm maybe i'm throwing things at the wall and seeing what sticks but is there a way to uh revitalize rural communities so people don't all gravitate to urban centers is that a possibility well all rural communities aren't created equal there are going to be some communities that are uh you know become nice places for older people to, to live yeah. there's going to become some smaller mid-sized towns in the united states where you know uh um ben and jerry's is going to have a factory or whatever i mean that that you know millennials are going to want to go to but the the trend overwhelmingly uh, in both Canada and the United States is to suburbanization. So when we're talking about people moving out of the downtown core, it's not like they're moving to rural Utah. Right. Uh, they're moving to uh, you know a town that's maybe an extra half hour outside of uh, what the commuter belt was before. I mean, there's places, for example, in, in my country like Nova Scotia that's seen a, a little bit of a surge in terms of people moving to the major city there, Halifax. But I mean, it's, it's pretty small numbers. I mean, it has a material effect on what's going on in Halifax, but it's not like everybody is decamping downtown Toronto and moving to Halifax or everybody's decamping downtown Manhattan and moving to, I don't know, uh, pick your, yeah. yeah, pick, pick Fargo or, yeah. or someplace that's not happening. All of those towns, a lot of them are experiencing population decline or at least very small population growth. Mm -hmm. um, maybe in the interest of time, um, I ask maybe to end on a more positive note than this is a, a fascinating conversation, uh, but two questions that I ask of all my guests at the end of every podcast, I'm going to bundle them together and you can answer them in whatever order you please. One question is what gives you hope for the future? It could be as general or specific as you wish. And the second question is what are five books, fiction, nonfiction that you would recommend to people? Hmm. What gives me optimism about the future? That human beings are incredibly adaptable and adaptive creatures. And whatever the challenges are that I'm talking about, I'm sure we will figure a way out of it. But the first thing that we have to do is identify what is actually going on. And uh, that uh, I think is a, um, uh, a very hard thing for people to do after they've been treated to a steady diet of what is now becoming rapidly becoming incorrect information. So uh, what gives me optimism is the, the adaptability of hum, the human species. Uh, five books. Um, my favorite book of all time, uh, uh, and, and I don't know why it is, is Eichmann in Jerusalem, uh, because it's such a well-written book by Hannah Arendt. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the reason I like it so much uh, is because it talks about an incredibly difficult subject you through a philosopher's eyes and she doesn't just catalog what happened she tries to get inside what would lead one of the most sophisticated countries that the world has ever known into such madness and and it's a really instructive lesson uh, the phrase that i remember from it all the time is think what you do think about the consequences of of, of your actions um and you know uh, uh adolf eichmann may have thought that he was uh, just uh scheduling trains, but what was on those trains really meant a lot. And obviously he knew more about what was going on than, right. than just that. But, uh, you know, the, a bureaucrat following orders um, and leading to what happened in Germany, I think is a great lesson for everyone. So I, I tend to read a lot of, uh, I find a lot of books that I read these days are just imponderably, you know, uh, they're, they're way, way too specific or way too general. <laughs> So in, in, in some sense. So I'm drawn more and more to really good biographies and really good histories. Uh, I, um, uh, I love Cherno, all Cherno stuff. 
I think his biography of Grant is one of the very best that I've ever read. Uh, and, and Ulysses S. Grant is going through a bit of a recrudescence in the United States, I think uh, long overdue. And I think it's a brilliantly written book. I love good biographers who can make people come alive. The other two biographies that I've read recently that I thought were brilliant were both by Anthony Roberts. And he writes about, he wrote a, probably and the definitive, Andrew, I think Andrew, Andrew, sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I wrote the definitive biography of Churchill. And his biography of, of Napoleon may be even better. I'm reading Tony Jute's um, history of post-war Europe right now. Uh, absolutely essential because it was something that I didn't know very much about. So I, as I get older, what I find um, is that, you know, I spent a lot of time really specializing in um, what was current and what was up to the moment. And my eye seems to go further back now. And the reason is because I'm more interested in how we got to where we got to and trying to explain why things are happening. And, and I find without a good understanding of history um, and biography, what through the eyes of, of the, the, uh, you know, the people who lived through those experiences, like uh, I read, a, uh, uh, I think Chernow wrote a brilliant biography of Washington, too, mm -hmm. uh, that I read. So I went read Hamilton, obviously, Washington, Phenomenal. Yeah. Grant. Um, and, uh, I've, uh, you know, I've got Dur Doris Kerwin's book. I've got a, or Goodwin's book. I've got to get to on, uh, David McCullough uh, too. Uh, yeah, I haven't, I haven't read, I'm just actually the guys turned me on to a lot of this is John Ibbotson, uh, who, uh, my co-author who's written some really fine biographies. Uh, he just wrote one of the, the best biography of a former prime minister, Stephen Harper, mm -hmm. uh, in Canada here. So, uh, yeah, he's he's one of my favorite authors because he's a literary, he's a very literary writer. But anyway, yes, that's the kind of stuff that I uh, uh, that I read a lot. I'm reading a lot these days. I, don't ask me to read like some you know contemporary, you know hot take on you know what's happening, and because I, I think most of it is just disposable and nonsense. Um, and uh, um, or, or what happened in an election campaign, I don't really care. <laughs> it's I'm more interested in the longer the longer right. term trends. Of, uh, of, of what's going on. Uh, and by the way, I'm just as guilty as write, of writing books like that myself sometimes. Um, I wanted to wrap this conversation up by thanking you for coming onto the podcast, for speaking My with pleasure. me. It's, it's very enlightening. And um, everyone should go read your book, Empty Planet, or get the audiobook as I did, because it's, it's I'm sure it's digestible, uh, easy to digest uh, either way. And he's a wonderful reader. Um, yeah, yes, guy. yes. Now, I'm going to tell you a quick funny story about that, sure, just to sure. finish your podcast. So uh, they were asking us about who should read the book. Uh, and uh, uh, there's the story of how this book got written is a story to tell at some point, too. But um, uh, the uh, it had been taken over by the editor in, in New York City uh, at Crown. And um, so they suggested a bunch of uh, uh, different readers to us. And uh, the one thing that they said about the, uh, the gentleman who did read it, whose name unfortunately just escapes me for the second, uh, was that he read Bob Woodward's book, uh, Fury. Mm -hmm. And uh, John's view was, I don't care, Daryl, what you want. I want to be able to say in one sentence, Bob Woodward and I. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's the same guy who read that book. And, and I, I've listened to parts of the book and it, and it is you can, you know, when people say to you, oh, why didn't you read your own book? It's like, did you listen to this? This guy's great. Yeah, um, yeah. For everybody, unless you're a really famous celebrity who has to read their own book, get somebody who's a trained Broadway actor to. Read. I agree. I agree. You'll be much happier with the result. Also, writers are writers, and some people are just not meant to, you know, speak because they don't have that kind of voice for. Yeah. Um, and they don't want to waste their time doing it. So. Um, so it sounds like for for you, we made the right choice. So that's good. yeah, good, good, good reader. Uh, thank you again, and all the best to you. My pleasure.